show. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much and bring on our featured presentation, which is Jim McQuillan. Jim McQuillan is uh, the president of Averis and one of our sponsors. And he's also the founder slash co-founder of LTSP, uh, which is the Linux Terminal Server Project, uh, as you can see in the little license, license plate behind him. Mm -hmm. And uh, also one of our board members as well. So is there anything else that I'm missing about you? Uh, um, that's, super, that's good. Superpowers, anything, anything oh, else? Yeah, I leap tall buildings in a single bound, yeah. Exactly, excellent. Yes, no, my, my superpower is the ability to sleep anywhere. <laughs> So, so thank you. Yes. Okay. So here we go. Let me see if I got the right buttons pushed and stuff. Uh, let's see. It looks like that's working. So um, let's see. We are talking today about Postgres streaming replication. Um, and I'm going to run uh, my presentation in a window because I have other windows where we can get a little interactive with it. Um, so this, uh, like I said, this is going to be interactive. Uh, if you have questions along the way, just uh, raise your hand or shout or whatever you got to do to get my attention. Um, uh, that way I will know that people are not putting people to sleep. Um, let's see. I've been using Postgres for, gosh, 15, 16, 17 years, something like that. And I've been doing replication with it for about nine or 10 years. Uh, and uh, so I figured I'd, I'd talk about it and show you what I'm doing. Uh, so let's see, um, figure out which buttons to push. What is replication? Uh, uh, well, first off, let me say, I'm not going to sit here and read the slides. I've got 29 slides, and I will bore you to pieces if I just sat here and read through them. But I will give you a minute to look over this slide. Uh, it's a quote from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, basically describes what replication is. Um, I'm not talking about replicants like in uh, um, I can't even think of the, the movie Scott Blade Runner. Runner. Blade Runner. Blade Runner. There you go. Yeah, uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about uh, replications and replication in computers, namely database replication. Uh, why would you want to replicate uh, reliability, fault tolerance, accessibility, or performance? Um, and, and I want to point out, these slides will be available on the website. I will send uh, the slide file over to Craig just as soon as we're done here. Uh, and I didn't want to send it over yet because there may be some uh, uh, modifications I want to do to the slides before I send them if we find things wrong. We're, we're debugging the slides as we go. Um, OK, so let's see. Um, Types of replication. We're talking about database replication here. You can replicate uh, by using shared disk, uh, file system replication, multi-master replication, primary secondary uh, replication. And I will jump a little further into that. A shared disk failover, that's where you have like a SAN with a giant disk space on it. And um, uh, you have a primary database server pointing at that SAN. And if your primary database server fails, your alternate uh, would kick in and all of your clients would need to point at your alternate server and uh, they would still have access to the database. Uh, there's one copy of the data. Uh, there's only one DB server active at a time. You avoid the synchronization overhead because there's you're not copying the data, but a failure of the SAN is catastrophic. You could lose your data. So that's that's uh, it's not a choice I, I choose to make. File system replication. Uh, it's kind of the same thing as the, the, the previous slide, only it happens at the operating system or file system layer. Um, you share your file system across the network. It could be NFS, could be DRBD for Linux. Um, where, again, only one database process or database management uh, process can access that database, uh, access the data at any given time. If your database craps out, if that server craps out, you just have to start using the other database server. Um, can't use them both at the same time. Multi-master. This is where you have two copies of the database or more. 
Uh, each copy shares its data with the other copies. It's a uh, it's a, a bi-directional kind of thing. Uh, you have clients connected to one database server, clients connected to the other database server. Any updates you do go back and forth. You you send an update to database A and it copies to database B. And the same the other way, you send it to B and it goes to A. It's very difficult to implement, uh, to implement well. Uh, you have things like conflict resolution. Uh, what happens if the same row is updated by two servers at the same time? Which one is correct? Right, that's uh, it's a tricky thing to do. Uh, there are databases out there that will do it. Typically, your application has to be aware of that, and you have to design your application for things like don't use serial numbers for for IDs in your in your tables. Use something like a UUID that's universally unique. Uh, that way, you don't have a conflict. You, you, two people inserting rows in the database are, uh, on different servers aren't going to insert rows with the same ID that way. Do what happened to um, to Michael Lucas, where he went through the entire presentation not realizing uh, he was no longer connected. No, no, that would be horrible. <laughs> yeah, it was. So an hour an hour into it, he finally got back connected and said, "Any questions?" <laughs> So we don't want that. So I'll, I'll check in with you occasionally if I don't hear any questions. Okay, so here's the big one, primary, secondary, or what typically has been called master-slave. That's kind of a, a, a not politically correct term to use anymore. Uh, so I, I'm sticking with primary, secondary. Uh, you have a primary database that pushes all of its updates out to your secondary databases or your uh, uh uh, replicas. Uh, all updates happen only on the primary server, uh, and, and then the, the the data gets pushed out to the secondaries. Uh, you can use the secondaries in read-only mode, uh, so you can improve your performance that way. If you have a lot of readers, they can be reading your your replicas instead of uh, using up bandwidth on the primary. Um, it's kind of a good way to make your data accessible to lots of users at the same time. Uh, let's see, there's some additional considerations uh, with with uh, replication, some things to think about, whether you want to do logical replication or right ahead log shipping, uh, whether you want to do synchronous updates or asynchronous updates. Logical replication um, typically is done with middleware. Uh, you can see in my diagram here, um, the clients send their requests to the middleware, and then it sends the data out to the databases. So you send an insert request, uh, an SQL command, and it uh, it sends that same command to both databases in this case, or uh, whatever number of replicas you have, it sends it to all of them. Uh, you can do it at the statement level, level, or you can do it using triggers. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, like I said, you can you can do a select statement or an insert statement, and it would just get farmed out to all of the databases. Uh, or if you're using triggers, you would send your your statement, and it would get to one of the database servers, and then that that server would uh, a trigger would fire, sending the request to the other database servers. Um, uh, there's solutions out there for uh, Postgres. Uh, you can do it with Sloney or PG Pool or Bacardo, or there's there's probably a dozen others uh, that you can do this with. You need to be careful with functions uh, that generate random things, like the random function or the gen random UUID, because they're gonna. If you send that function or that command to multiple servers, each one's gonna get a different value. So if you're using that for a primary key in a in a table or an index or key of any type, um, you want to be consistent. You want to make sure that a, a patient that you created has the same ID, or or, a, or or an inventory part has the same ID amongst all your servers. So it gets a little tricky doing logical replication. Again, if your application is aware of it, you design accordingly. It, it can work just perfectly. Right ahead, log shipping. That's the one we're going to be talking about today. Uh, it's an all or nothing kind of a thing. You would uh, uh, replicate your entire database cluster. Uh, and when I use the word cluster here, I'm talking about Postgres's use of that term. It's really the 
the collection of databases that Postgres manages. Uh, when, you, when you set up a database in Postgres, you create this thing called a cluster. And within the cluster, it's uh, you, you create database, uh, you create users, you create multiple databases if you want. So you're going to replicate the entire cluster. Uh, and that includes users and everything else that you've created in that database. Permissions, all that stuff gets, gets replicated. Uh, we're going to use the write ahead log. Uh, and normally I would like to ask uh, you know people to raise their hands if they know what I'm talking about when I say write ahead log. But it's a little difficult with uh, this virtual event. But the write ahead log is basically something used for, um, for the, by the database management system. Uh, everything you do in the database, every update you do, whether it's an insert or an update or whatever, um, goes through the write ahead log. Things get written to the write ahead log, and then they get written to the database. Uh, they get written to, the, written to the individual tables. This way, if your database server crashes, when you bring it back up, uh, it can either finish that transaction or roll back that transaction. You end up with a database that's always consistent. Uh, so the write ahead log there is, is for that. Uh, we can utilize that write ahead log for replication. We can send those write ahead logs to your secondary servers. Uh, and here I've just got a little screenshot, part of a screenshot showing if, if you looked in the PG wall directory, um, you would see a bunch of files like this, a whole bunch of 16 meg files. Each of those files contains the updates that, that happened to your database. And you can send those, those files to your other servers and apply them on your other servers and it will make the same update on your other on your secondary servers. You don't have to do it yourself. The Postgres will do that for you. Uh, by using a uh, write ahead logs, um, you're basically queuing them up on disk on your primary server. So if your secondary goes down, if you lose connectivity to your secondary database server, uh, you still have these write ahead logs on the primary. So once your secondary server comes back up, uh, we can just shoot these files over to it and it'll apply them to your database. Uh, and I think I mentioned before, the replics, replicas uh, can be used in uh, a read-only mode. So while your primary database server is read-write, your replicas are read-only. Uh, one of the things you got to think about is whether you want to do synchronous updates. Uh, and the choice is synchronous or asynchronous. Now with synchronous updates, you write to the primary database server. You issue your, your insert or your update command to the primary database server. And it will send out the, com the, the, the uh, commands to the replicas. And it'll wait until those replicas respond that everything has been updated before it returns control back to your application. So you will sit there and block. You will wait for that update to be complete on all of your replicas before you can continue on. It's a very safe way to do it. There's very, very little chance of losing data this way. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's very well suited for readers because all replicas will have current data. So you can have readers reading all of any one of your, your replicas out there uh, and they'll all have the current data. The problem is performance is really bad when you have lots of writes. If you're doing lots of inserts and lots of updates you you got to sit there and wait for all those replicas to, to be updated before you, you can continue on with, with your application. Uh, so depending on your application uh, or your needs, uh, you may or may not want synchronous updates. You can do it in Postgres. There, there's a it's an easy thing to configure, uh, but be be ready for the uh, for the for the performance uh, problems you'll have. Um, and it doesn't handle the the uh, one of the replicas going offline very well. Because if, if you have a replica that goes offline and you're sitting there with a synchronous update, you're going to sit there until that replica comes back up. Kind of think about if that's really what you want. Uh, what I use and what I'm going to demonstrate here tonight is asynchronous updates. You issue your update to the primary and it'll take care of sending the updates to the secondaries but you're not going to get you're not going to get blocked by that. It'll happen in the background. Uh, they say replicas are uh, consistent eventually. 
and that sounds a little bit scary. You know, how do you know if your if your replica is has been updated or not? Well, if you're if you've got a nice fast network, uh, if these are local replicas, eventually it is like milliseconds, maybe nanoseconds. It happens very fast. If you've got a replica that's that's off site over uh, over a, uh, over the internet, well, it's going to take longer for that replica to be to become consistent with the with the rest of the <laughs> database. Uh, there's the possibility of losing data if the primary crashes before the replicas are updated. All right, if it takes a long time to get to the replica, and your primary crashed, well, the data in transit isn't going to make it to your uh, to your replica, or it's not going to at least be complete uh, uh, going to your replica. Um, so you may lose out on some transactions that way. Um, if the clients are reading from a replica, you can get stale data if if the replica is not caught up uh again if uh if that's a concern then maybe you don't want to be reading from your replicas you just want to read from the primary um if the replica is slow or goes offline it won't affect the client so remember i said in a synchronous scenario uh, if one of your replicas is offline you're going to sit there and block and wait for that to come back up before your transaction completes uh, with asynchronous you're not going to wait for that replica as soon as you write to the to the primary, uh, it's considered done for you. So here's a real world example. Now this is a diagram of a, of a, a site that I'm actually running. Uh, this is in New York. Uh, it's about a two terabyte database, a little over, there's about 2.2 .2 terabytes right now. There's a primary server that they have locally. Uh, there's uh, two secondaries, two replicates, replicas that are on site, that replica two and replica three. And off site, about 30 miles away, they've got a, a, a replica out there. In fact, it's two replicas. Uh, it's a 200 megabit per second link uh, between the two offices, 30 miles away. There's a, a replica 1A is the main replica uh that's coming that, that comes directly from the primary and then replica 1b is a replica of 1a this is a cascading replica so everything that goes from the primary gets into replica 1a and then replica 1a sends it off to replica 1b the reason i do it that way is because uh first off it takes almost three days to make a full replica on a 200 megabit uh, uh pipe uh, so if I'm if I for me to start up a replica that that doesn't have any data, it's it's almost three full days uh, over that 200 megabit pipe to get that data over. When we do the disaster recovery testing, uh, we flip the replica from from being a replica to to we promote it to be in a primary server. Well, that's great. We run through the test, everything's fine. Now for me to get back to being a replica, I have to start fresh and copy that entire two terabytes across the link again. So instead of doing it that way, when I go to test my disaster recovery, I just take replica 1B and I promote that to be a primary and I can do my DR testing. And if everything's fine, then I can throw away that replica and I can re-replicate 1A to a new 1B. That takes about four, four and a half hours to do instead of three days. So you can see where uh, where that would probably make sense. Uh, my test is just fine. I can test off that replica 1B, um, but I don't have the overhead of rebuilding the replica uh, over a three day period. Uh, this site has about 140 users on it. It's not a huge site, but it's a lot of data. It's a mammography clinic, and they have uh, a lot of documents. Uh, they got some X-rays. They got some scanned images, and of course, they have their transactions, their uh, billing information, patient information, that kind of stuff. Everybody still with me, Craig? Uh, I saw a nod. Yep, I'll take still that. here. Okay, thank still you. Still here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, for this example, what I'm going to do is uh, I've got a primary database set up. And I'm going to replicate it to two different replicas. I've got a gigabit 
connection to one of the replicas and a hundred megabit connection to the other. Um, I, I wanted to do that so that, it, you know, if I only put like um, 500 megs of data in my database, it replicates so fast over a local area network. Um, I can't show you, you know, the thing happens about as fast as you can press enter. So I slowed down the link to replica two. Now these three machines are all just virtual machines on my uh, my desktop machine here. Uh, but through the magic of IP tables, I've throttled down the link to replica two so that uh, I can show you what it's doing while it's doing it. Uh, I'm doing right ahead log shipping, asynchronous updates. I've got three servers, like I said. This is a brand new installation of Ubuntu 2004 running Postgres 12. Uh, and Postgres normally puts the databases, I think, in var lib Postgres SQL. Uh, in fact, it's right here, var lib Postgres SQL slash 12 slash main. I, I don't like that. I, I typically mount my, in fact, I always mount my databases, uh, first of all, on a separate file system, and, it's, uh, and I set up encrypted file systems. So I mount my database on slash, uh, my database file system on slash serve, and then I create my subdirectory slash database in there, and that's where I put my database. So I just find it easier to work with slash serve instead of slash var slash lib slash postgres ql slash 12 slash main. Um, you can you can do it in the normal place if you want. I, I just I've been I've been doing it this way for so long. I don't see a need for me to change. Um, so that's my example configuration. You can see the IP addresses, uh, 141, 142, and 143. Uh, the primary server, it's a fresh Ubuntu 2004 server. I just set it up on Sunday, Saturday or Sunday. Uh, there's a couple of commands I run to set it up. I set the time zone. And I uh, install Postgres from from uh, the, 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 uh, the apt-get repository. Uh, that's what I did in this case. I always build Postgres myself in, in my production environments. I like to take the source code of Postgres and build it where I want it with the options that I want. Uh, that way I can control exactly what version I get. If you use the packages that the, that the uh, distribution provides, you're going to get what they want to give you. Um, like right now, uh, uh, Postgres is actually up to version 13. And I'll be moving to version 13 soon for my customers. I don't want to have to upgrade the operating system too in order to get that. I'll just grab the source code, and build it. Uh, and when I build it, I add a few options. There's a, an option to create uh, for the PG crypt module, which gives you some encryption facilities and uh, the UUID function that I want and a few other things. So I like to build Postgres myself. Anyway, in this case, we installed Postgres from, from the apt repositories. Uh, I turn on, I, I, when you install it from uh, using app get, it actually installs it and enables it and, and uh, starts it up. So I immediately stop it and disable it because I don't want my database starting when I boot my, my machine. Uh, I mentioned that I always use an encrypted file system on my machines. Well, when you boot up a machine with an encrypted file system, you have to unlock the file system with a passphrase in order to mount it. So I like to do all that in a manual step. I boot the machine to make sure everything's okay. I go to unlock the file system, then I mount it, then I start my database. So that's what I've done here. Stop the stop the uh, Postgres that's running, disable it so it doesn't start on system startup. Um, the other thing, this uh, echo command here that's setting up a path, Debian and Ubuntu, they like to put some wrappers around the Postgres fun, uh, commands, like pg underscore ctl. They, they hide that from you. Um, I like using pg ctl, pg control, to uh, start and stop my databases. So I set up the path so I can get to it. So that's all I'm doing there. Uh, I create my database directory. I create my log directory. S Scott here. Permissions. Scott, yes. Yes, just a question. Is there yeah. an advantage to using the uh, PG SQL control way of doing oh, it uh, versus the over. system D or just personal preference? Um, well, even system D is going to still use the tool, the wrappers that that um, post that uh, Debian created. 
uh, Martin Pitt from Debian. You remember him, don't you? Um, yeah, yeah. He uh, he created some wrappers. I, I don't even remember what it's called right now. He he created those things, I believe, so that you could run lots of databases on your system. You could add different versions of databases. My database server is usually a single purpose machine to run a single database. Right. It's a big, big database, but it's just a single database. And when I want to install a, a different version of Postgres on it, I will do that myself. And I will run the PG uh, uh, convert utility to convert the database. And, and that's fine. I don't need this wrapper that lets me choose which database version I want to run. Right. Uh, it, it's just not necessary. So okay. you could still use system D. You'd have to write your own script. If, in fact, I, in some cases, I do have a system D script that uh, will start the database. So then you use uh, what sys control or sys system control yeah. to start it. Um, I just don't do it that way. I'm, I'm kind of right. old school. I don't right. know if there's an advantage one way or the other. You know, the, the thing about uh, system D is it lets you set up dependencies and stuff so that you you can say don't start the database until the network right. is there or you're you're just wanting complete control over the idea yeah. is that you've got control over what what's going on yeah that and i've been doing this so long it's it's just doing it you know i i'm, I'm stuck in the mud i guess I, I'm just yeah no I fair have. enough doing it the way i always have okay uh, I, I, i'm not going to say you shouldn't do it that way or you should it's just the way i'm okay doing it. All right. All right. So we create the database directory. We create the log directory. Uh, set the permissions on that. When I move my mouse, do you guys see it? Yep. You, okay. So I'm pointing at that right there. Set the ownership on the on the database and the log files. It needs to be owned by Postgres. Um, I set the permissions to be 0700. Postgres is really fussy about that. It doesn't want anybody else mucking around with the files. Um, certainly don't want any casual users in there doing things. Um, I do an SU to become the Postgres user and I initialize the database. This, this is stuff I've already done. And, and there's a set of things I've already done for this presentation. And in a couple of minutes, we're gonna get to the part that we're gonna go through our step-by-step uh, -step manually. I, this is just what I did to, to get going. Um, uh, we'll get to the good stuff in three more slides. Uh, so I initialize the database that basically creates the database cluster. Uh, and I have to make a few changes to the PostgreSQL comp file. Uh, we want to listen to the ethernet interface. That's why I put the star there. Now in listen addresses, you can put the IP address of the actual interface you want to listen on. I think you can put the name of the interface there if you want. Um, I just put a star there because I'm going to listen on all of them. I want to listen on 127.0.0.1 and on um, 172.16.94.141. Uh, I turn on logging collector so that we can collect up all the logs from Postgres. Now, these are these are not the write-ahead logs. These are the logs telling you what's going on, telling you that the database started, and, uh, warnings from things. <clears throat> Uh, I point the log directory at slash serve slash log because that's where I put my logs. And I specify I want the file name to be year, month, day, dot log. So that every day it uh, generates a, a, a new log file. Start the database with this uh, PG control uh, dash D points to the, the directory where your database is. And I say start. Uh, I create a user, Jam. Uh, I created myself as a super user. And I create the mug database. Okay. That stuff I've already got. Now on the secondary servers, I've built them the same way. Right? Fresh install of Ubuntu 2004. I set my time zone. I uh, installed Postgres, shut it down, disabled it, because I'm going to run my own Postgres. All right. And I set the path. And again, these slides will be available soon on the on the website, so you don't have to take notes or anything on this stuff. Maybe if you are taking notes, maybe some of the stuff that I said. But again, this whole presentation is going to be available in video form. Uh, again, I think there will be a pointer from the website, or you can go to our YouTube channel. So let's do some replicating, shall we? Everybody still there? 
Yep. See some, see some heads bobbing and stuff. Follow, Good. Following closely. Okay, so if you've already got a database server set up and running that you've been using for a long time, like you, Scott, uh, and you want to start replicating it, it's pretty simple. There's only a few things you have to do. In your pghba file, uh, .conf, you have to add a, add a line uh, to allow your other host or hosts to replicate from it. So in fact, I've got, uh, I'm going to, uh, this is the row I ran, uh, ran this thing in a window so that I could run some, t uh, some of these things. I'm logged into the primary, it says right there, primary and up there, uh, yeah, that there too. So you can always tell which window I'm in. I've got two windows here. Um, I'm going to become super user just because I like to. So I serve slash database. And if we look at the PGH, well, let's do this. There's a whole bunch of files in this directory. Config files, database files, all kinds of stuff. Okay, but we're gonna edit postgresql.com. Uh, there we go. Um, set no ink search. Uh, I just got to do that. Um, uh, so this is the configuration file. I'm going to stretch the window bigger so you all can see it. All right. Uh, in fact, that's not the file I want to look at yet. I want to look at the PGHBA. This is the file that controls permissions to the database. Uh, permissions in terms of who can connect to it. And there's uh, some some notes about what the records need to look like. I'm not going to get into that. This is, uh, if you want to learn about really the PGA, PGHBA file, um, it's very well documented in the manual. In fact, it's even well documented right in the file. Okay, so we get on to the end. And I've already added these, these records. See these two records here? the two replication records. Now I said I'm setting up replica one and replica two. So I've got the IP addresses from replica one and replica two. Um, I've also set trust. This basically means uh, uh, those replicas can connect up without without a uh, without a password. It's not a great way to go in a production environment. What you really wanna do is probably go with a secure uh, an SSL type of connection with that's what i do i, I have uh, certificates on my machines uh on both the primary and the secondaries and the certificates all have to be valid and have to match and, uh, that everything has to be uh uh kosher for it to, for the connection to be allowed uh, i'm dealing with sensitive patient data so i have to be that careful but for this little demonstration uh, again this is not a talk about ssl and postgres I'll leave that to uh, I'll, I'll leave that up to the reader. Uh, so we set up our replication records. Uh, we say that these two hosts can connect to it. And that's that's it. Um, slide this out of the way. Then the next thing we do we have to signal the database server that we modified that file. So we have to reload the database, and that will reread the config file and uh, magically allow connections from those two hosts. I've already done that on this because I did some testing earlier. Uh, and then this is where we get into some some cool stuff. We have to create something called replication slots. Uh, it's just a simple function, PG create physical replication slot. Uh, we run that. In fact, I do need to run that. So let me, uh, how do I do this here? I want to be able to type it and see it. And I can't cut and paste from, from that thing. Um, let's see. Minus I minus U Postgres. Let's see. Select PG create. Uh, I've got to print it out right here. So that's how I'll do it. PG create physical replication slot replica one. And I have to name the database. So this is how you run a command from the command line. This is how you can run a database command, uh, an SQL command from the from the command line. And right now I have to run it as uh, user Postgres. 
That's why I'm doing the sudo minus I minus U thing. Okay, so I'm going to do that and create that. And we got one created. And I'm going to do the same thing again, only I'm going to do it for replica two. Okay, so I've got my two uh, replication slots. Um, let's go in there, PSQL mug. You can see them by doing by, by doing a select from PG replication slots, and there's my two slots. Doesn't wrap very well, but they're there. If I do this, I just turned on slash X, which shows them this way. See, I got my slot replication replica one, uh, and they're good to go. So I've got my replication slots. Next. And I did both of those. So we're still configuring replica one. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Now we're going to move on to configure replica one. And what we need to do on replica one, I'm going to leave replica two for a little bit later in the talk. Uh, we'll add replica two uh, kind of after everything's up and running because I'm going to show you what that looks like. Uh, so replica one. Um, if you look now in slash serve, there's nothing there. So I'm going to create make. I'm going to do this uh, so serve slash database and slash serve slash log. That'll create both of the directories for me. And I'm going to set the, the uh, ownership on them. Serve slash log. And I'm going to see, mod 0700 slash serve slash database slash serve slash log uh, slash serve. Okay, so you see I've got uh, database directory, the log directory, they're, they're read, write, execute for the owner, nobody else, owned by Postgres, group Postgres. And now we get into the fun. So I'm going to do this. Just rearrange things so we can see it, right? So our database, uh, if you look in there, it's empty. Uh, oh, I don't have permission. Right, nothing in serve database. So let's go ahead and run the command Got to do it as user Postgres, because the everything that gets created in the database directory has to be owned by Postgres. So we need to do this as user Postgres. We're going to run the pg base backup command with a dash d slash serve slash database. That's where we tell it where we want to put the replica, what what you know what directory we want to put it into. Wall method is stream. We want to we want to we're doing streaming replication here. The slot we used is replica one. We want to create the recovery file. Recovery.conf. It's no longer called recovery.conf. Uh, they they store the options in a in right in the uh, Postgres config file now, but this is kind of a holdover from older versions. Uh, we want to monitor the progress as it's doing it. Uh, and our host that holds our primary is 172.16.94.141. I could use host names here if I had DNS set up or my Etsy host file configured. Uh, I don't, so I'm just going to go with IP addresses. So here goes. There, it's done. <laughs> we have a we we have just replicated the database. <laughs> okay, there's not much in the database. All right. I mean, you can see it did uh, 139 megs. Okay. There is some, I, I did create a, a test file, a, a, a test table in the database, and it's got some data in it. I think it's, well, obviously there's 139 megs worth of stuff, but we created the database or we created the replica. Any questions so far? No. No. Okay. So there's our, uh, we are now replicating. Let's start the database, all right? Sudo minus I minus U Postgres PG CTL dash D slash serve slash database start. 
that's going to start up our database. There, it's running. And I can go wider with this, and I guess it would be easier to read, wouldn't it? Right? Okay, it is running. Okay. Yeah, uh, this log information here doesn't tell us a whole lot about what's going on. Uh, well, let's go back to the slides for a second. Is it working? If you look in uh, the logs in slash serve slash log, which we will do right now. Um, I'm just going to do that. Slash serve slash log. I've got a few log files out here. Oh, just one, I guess. Um, so if we go look at that. Here's our log. Right. Forget about this interrupted thing. That's because uh, I shut down the database earlier on the other server, and it's actually copying that. I think. Um, so we we entered standby mode. We are in standby mode. The replica is what's called standby mode. Uh, the redo information. I, I'll get into that a little bit later. It's uh, it means something. It's not something you need to worry about. Uh, we reached a consistent recovery state. Uh, the database is ready to accept read-only connections and started streaming right, at, right ahead logs from the primary at this point in time on timeline one. Okay. So that's telling the log is telling me that the database is up and running and, and we're live. We are replicating. Uh, there's another thing we can do back on the server. Uh, let's do, uh, no, no, I did not want it to launch that. Yeah, no, get that out of here. I accidentally hit the Microsoft Word icon. Hmm. Get that, get that the hell out of here. Um, so here's my database, right? If I look at replication logs now, okay, you can see here, active. It's true. So replica one is active. Okay. Uh, replica two is not. And that's going to stay that way until we set up replica two. Oh, that's not what I want. Get that out of there. Okay. So uh, it's working, right? We just like this uh, screenshot here shows uh, replica one is active. So let's. Um, there's also another table we can look at. Uh, that gives us more information about it. Select star from PG stat replication. And that shows us uh, uh, when the back end started. Uh, I think uh, we must be in um, uh, the time zone where it's probably GMT, because I'm pretty sure it's not uh, 36 minutes after midnight. So the, the back end started at 1236 GMT. Um, the last reply we got was at uh, 1239 GMT, right? Uh, so anyway, it's uh, th that replica is up and running. It's been running for uh, four minutes now. So those are handy, handy things that I'm going to go back a slide. PG stat replication is good. Uh, but this is the one I look at all the time, PG replication slots, to make sure that my replicas are up and running because uh, it's kind of important that your replicas are running. Okay, so there's some files of interest in slash serve slash database. I'll just show you those real quick. Uh, and this is on the replica, so that's what this guy is. Um, because it's a replica, there's a file called standby um the wrong directory there's a file called standby signal when that file is there that's like a it's a signal to the database server uh when the database starts up if that file is there it's going to try to connect to a uh, primary just the existence of that file is going to make it try to connect to the primary and the other file is the normal postgres config file well the, the auto config file Let's take a look at that. PostgreSQL auto con. When you look at that, you see this stuff? This primary con info, that's your connection to your primary. Uh, we're connected as user Postgres. Those are interesting. This here is obviously important. 
that's the host that we're connecting to. The port is the default Postgres 5432. There's some stuff in here about SSL. We're not using SSL in this case. So uh, we prefer it, but we've not enabled it. So it's not going to use it. We're not doing compression. There's some Kerberos stuff in here too, which we don't really care about. And the slot name, that's obviously important too. That tells us what slot we're going to use back on the server. So those two things, those two files are, are what's used. To, uh, that's the only difference between this and a primary database server is these two things, the connection info and that standby dot uh, signal file. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I, I'm going to show you how you can promote that replica to be a primary, but let's let's not do that yet. Let's play some play with the database a little bit, right? Uh, let's see. I'm going to shrink these things down a little bit. If I go with a smaller font, can you guys see it? Okay. Uh, I got to do this. Is that too small for you guys to see? No, it's fine. It's okay fine. for me. Okay, I'm not hearing any complaints. Let's see if I can go down like one or two steps more. Is that all right? Yep. Okay. Still we're okay. Gonna we're gonna stick with that then, because it helps if I can fit more on the screen. Right. Uh, let's uh, let's get out of there. Okay. So um, this is the replica. This is the primary. Uh, I'm going to turn that. Okay, so you can see I have a table called example. This table has an ID, a code, and a description. Select count from example. It's got uh, 1,100,000 rows in it, right? Uh, same thing here PSQL mug. Looks the same, doesn't it? Looks like, uh, I mean, as you would expect. Um, example. Um, select star from example. Order by ID uh, limit 10. Okay, there's 10 rows in that. That's the first 10 rows. I do the same thing here. Um, uh, example, order by ID, limit 10, right? Same 10 rows, magically. Okay, I'm going to need you to hold it there for about five minutes so I can check every character. <laughs> okay, okay, good, good. Uh, I, I'm going to make some changes on the primary, uh, and, and you'll see, in fact, let's do this. Uh, I'm just going to do a slash watch. And it's just going to keep requerying that thing every two seconds. Okay. So now let's update uh, example set description equals my first update where ID equals one. See that? Wow. See a change over there? Now, the only reason it seemed like it was a little slow is because I'm, I'm waiting every two seconds before refreshing that screen. That's pretty yep. cool. The update actually happened probably in a few milliseconds. All right. Um, uh, let's see. I can do things like, uh, let's see. I have, uh, let's see. Let's do this. Um, uh, shoot, what's the command to uh, change directory while I'm in here? I usually don't do this. Uh, screw it. I'm just going to CD mug, PSQL mug. I have some commands here to do interesting things like create 100,000 rows. Uh, let's do this then. I'm going to quit that. Select count from example uh, slash watch. Uh, watch. And that's just going to keep refreshing that thing every two seconds. So now let's run uh, create 100,000 rows. See that? Wow. It's fast, right? Very. I got another command. Amazing. Create 1 million rows. 1 million rows, okay? 
So I do that and watch on the right hand side. Not yet, not yet. Okay, there. You see it? It returned on the left, and half a second later, it returned on the right. Yeah. Right? Pretty That's cool, pretty fast. It? Yeah, it is kind of neat. Uh, let's see how big is my database getting now. Oh, gosh. I got to stretch this thing out so I can read it. Uh, my database is 216 megs. Let's make it a little bigger. Yeah, originally it was 136 or something, like 139. Yeah, and I created, uh, what did I create? A million, 1 million, 100,000 rows. I basically doubled it in size. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I'm going to create another million rows. Okay. Let's see if you can, <laughs> let's see if we can catch this. Uh, if I overlay these windows just right. Uh, If I kind For some of reason, we're not way. seeing your window again. You may want to reshare your screen. Really? Yeah. I see it in my share. Yeah, I'm seeing it all right. Maybe it's you. I see it all right. There it goes. Yeah. Okay. So I've got these two overlapping windows, right? The, the one below is showing me I've got 2.2 .2 million rows. I'm going to create another million rows, and we'll just see how fast that goes. Creating, 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 creating. Done. Done. Five seconds, yep. Yeah. Wow. Well, that five seconds <laughs> was really just a, most of that time was just inserting the rows on the primary. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, it got to the secondary just about as quick. Faster, right? it looks like. Yeah. So, um, well, I think what was happening is, is as it was uh, as it was inserting those rows, it's creating those those um, those files in the PG wall directory, those right ahead logs, those 16 meg things. Yep. I think it's actually streaming those to the secondary server as it's creating them. So those things were, it, it's, it's not like it waited till the hundred, until the million rows were done on the first one before it sent them to the second one. It was almost a parallel operation. It was creating them on the first one and and like pipelining them and sending them over to the secondary server uh, as it was creating them. So it, it happens that fast, right? Um, so again, let's see how big is our database. Can I see that in here? It's, our database is now 310 megs. That's a good size. Hmm. Um, let's go back over here to the secondary. So, so Jim? Yeah. Then do we see it only jump by a million because it waits till a final transaction complete record is sent yes yes while we're um while we're in the middle of an insert that is a transaction okay so i think actually our select on the secondary that's doing a select count i think it's blocked because there's a transaction in process and we're trying to select a table that's in the middle of being updated i'm not sure if it's blocking it or not but we won't see them, you know, we won't see partial updates. We, okay. We will, it's only visible to us when it's, when the transaction is committed. And okay. we've got auto, auto commit is turned on. So that's why you don't see me doing begin work and commit. So that it, all happens automatically for me. Thank um, you. Sure. So there's, you know, I, again, there's my tables. Uh, if I, if I do DT plus, It'll show me that that table is 234 megs. My entire database is 310. That's because there's an index out there for this table. Um, I think there is. Yeah, I mean, just my index on that table is 69 megs. So um, remember, this is a read-only database, right? Uh, my replica is read-only. I can't create. Uh, uh, test one ID series real. I can't do this, right? So it's a read only transaction. Hmm. All right. So remember, I said we were going to promote this database to be a primary. There's yeah. a couple of ways we can do it. Okay, I can I can issue a PG control command and tell it to promote. That I do at the command line on the on the secondary. Let's say the, the primary machine just died, right? Uh, so I'm on the secondary. I can issue that command. 
PG control dash D promote. Or I can uh, run a function. Uh, and, and that's what I'm going to do in just a second. Or the third way is I can configure in my Postgres config direct uh, config file. I can configure a promote trigger file. And I can say, yeah, my promote trigger file is slash temp slash replica one. All I have to do then is create that file and it will trigger my database to go to become a primary. It'll promote it. So all I got to do is like touch slash temp slash replica one and my database breaks the breaks off the replication and becomes a primary. Doesn't do anything to the old primary. The old primary is still sitting back there humming along just fine. It's just not being replicated anymore. But what we are going to do, I'm going to just do this one. Select PG promote. And you have to be a database super user to run this command. Like just uh, user nobody can't do this. Uh, but remember when I created, when I did a create user, I said uh, jam, that's my name or my username, uh, dash dash super user. So a jam is allowed to do this. So I'm gonna do this. Okay, boom. We are now in a read write database. I can create that table. See that? Hmm. Pretty slick, huh? Meanwhile, back on the primary, stretch this guy out. Uh, one of these things is going to give me, uh, I'd be faster to type it in, <laughs> PG replication slots. See, our database, our, our replica is no longer active. Mm -hmm. We have no, no replica. So let's fix that. All right, I'm going to get out of the database on the replica. I'm going to go back to serve. And I'm going to, first of all, shut down this database. Dash I dash U Postgres PG CTL dash D database. All I got to do is, uh, because I'm in the serve directory, I just have to say database, right? Uh, in fact, what I usually do is I'm in the database directory. Uh, I can't be in the database directory. Never mind. Um, usually, I'm actually the user Postgres, and I, I'm in the database directory doing this. But sudo minus i minus u Postgres pg ctl dash d database stop. Uh, stop. There. Oh. Oh, come on. Ah. Uh, it's because the dash I actually puts me in Postgres's home. Okay. Boom. Database is shut down. So, uh, I'm not, yeah. When you promoted the replica, mm -hmm. what does that mean to the clients that were still connected to the old primary? Nothing at all. They're still connected to the primary. Can when I, I was, still write? Oh, sure. Now I have two primaries, and they're, uh -oh. not, they're not talking to each other. What what I was simulating there was, let's say, the primary actually died. Died, okay. Right? I, I was assuming the primary was gone. Uh, assuming the primary was gone. Uh, so I just brought up the secondary. And, um, and if, if you had actually done this in a real database with people writing to, you, you, just, you just created a data a loss situation. <laughs> Well, uh, let me let me show you something here. This last line that I didn't show you yet on the slide. After promoting, you need to point all of your clients to the new primary. Yeah. Okay. So presumably, your primary database server croaked. Yep. So now your clients are all calling you on the phone saying nothing's working. Right. So yep. you you look at it and say, Ah, yeah, the server died. So you promote your your replica to be the new primary. And you have to point all your clients to the new primary. And for us, one of the easiest ways to do it, well, well, if you have separate machines, you're not going to do this in a virtual environment like I've got here. Uh, you could have both of those machines with an with the Ethernet interface with the same IP address and just pull the cable out of one database server and plug it into the other. It's one way you can do it. Um, 
the way we do it is our, our database servers each have multiple IP, multiple interfaces. Um, we can SSH into any of them, you know, into the primary interface and do whatever we want to do. But the clients all connect up to an IP address on, on the second interface. And we'll just bring down, if we want to keep the server running, we would bring down that interface on the primary server and we would bring up the interface on the secondary server and, and it would have the same IP address. So now you might have to wait for the ARP table to flush on the switch, but your clients are going to be able to start connecting to the second database server, the, the secondary. Um, you know, there's a number of ways you can do that. You can even get some middleware that will, like PG pool, uh, would basically be monitoring for whichever server is up and it would automatically direct your clients to it. Uh, or you could change, you know, you could, you could just, you could have separate IP addresses. You could change your uh, DNS entry for those. But you want a really short time to live, a, a really short TTL on your DNS if you're going to do that. Because you don't want, you don't want your, uh, your clients to have to wait like 15 minutes before they can actually get the right IP address. Uh, okay, so what was I going to do uh, back here? So I shut down the database. Those things are still there. I'm going to blow away. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to blow away these files. Uh, actually, I'm just going to blow away. Uh, let's see, Postgres. Um, a database. So I'm going to blow away everything out of the database directory. I don't care about the log file, right? Did I type that all right? Anytime I use, uh, oh, I forgot the command itself, rm. Oh, and I got to do that. So there, I'm going to blow away everything in the database because that's all a primary, and I've shut down that primary. That's our test primary. It's not the real. That's your replica. That's my replica that I promoted to be a primary. Yeah. Right. And now since I promoted it to be a primary, you can't get it back to be in a replica. Once it's a primary, it can't go back to be in a replica. So the only, the only real way to do it is blow it away and re PG base back up it. Okay. Reinitialize the replica. So I'm going to blow away the stuff that is, that's in database. Um, anytime I use an RM minus RF, I like triple check that I've typed it right. Uh, that looks good to me. Okay, so there. While you were using, though, your replica as your primary, wouldn't you have at some point had to copy or sync it back to the primary once the primary was up? Again? Oh, in a real world environment, if yeah. you, if you like, uh, uh, if you did this and then you rebuilt your primary machine, you went out and bought new discs for it or new power supply or whatever, whatever it needed. When you, when you use, bring that machine back into production, you're going to PG base back at PG base back up in the opposite direction. You're going to, you're going to sit on the primary machine and, and do, and basically make it replicate the promoted primary machine, right? Or the promoted replica. So that's a very good point. Yeah. You're going to want to, in some instances, you might have database servers that are equivalent hardware, and whichever one is the primary is, is the primary, right? Whichever one is operating in primary mode is your primary. And if a machine croaks, you promote a different machine to be the primary, and then you repair the croaked machine, and it becomes a new secondary. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, my database server out in New York is a much bigger machine a uh, much more powerful machine than my secondary machines are, my secondary database servers. So if we had to use a replica, if we had to promote a replica to become a primary, we would want that to be for a very short period of time. We would, we would get that primary fixed and back in operation as soon as possible, in which case we'd have to copy the data back to it. And, you know, and we use these same set of commands to do that. PG base backup. Um, okay, so we're sitting here now, and our database directory is empty. We do not have a database on our replica machine. 
So I'm going to do it again, right? I just grabbed that out of uh, my history and it's going to just do it again. So here we go. Oh, it's not empty. What did I do? Did I not remove those files? Uh, wait, Are there dot know. files in there? Yes, you do. Uh, ls minus l slash serve slash database. No, it's all still there. Well, let's let's get rid of it for sure. Uh, ls minus l makes me wonder what I did remove. Okay, we're going to get rid of this stuff in the database directory. And it's gone now. Okay, so PG base backup. Okay, so I'm going to run this command. It's going to take a little bit longer because the database is three times bigger now. <laughs> but it's done. Right, and I'm going to start the database. Remember that command? Mm -hmm. Start the database. And over on the primary, we're going to look and uh and we're back to active okay everybody's happy there so our our uh our uh, secondary is up and running our, our, our replica one is up and running okay so let's go over to replica two now introduce another window into here Oh, we get on replica two. It's exactly the same as the first one. Um, nothing in there, so I have to run those commands to uh, to create the directory and the uh, slash serve slash log, create the database directory and the log directory. Fortunately, I can't use command history because it's a whole different machine. Mm -hmm. Change the ownership. Uh, slash serve slash database. Slash serve slash log. Let's change the permissions. 0700. Slash serve slash database. Slash serve slash log. Um, if you look there, and there they are. Okay, so now we're going to run that uh, that command. I could copy and paste it. Yeah. Just cut and paste here. Okay, but I got to be careful because uh, I have to change something in there. We are no longer just replica one. We are replica two. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Same command. We're going back to the same primary one forty one. Only we're going to be replica two now. Waiting for checkpoint and here. Now remember, replica one is on a gigabit network. Yep. Replica two is on a hundred megabit network. Wow. Right. Hmm. Um, while this is running, it's going to take a few minutes, right? Um, let's see over on primary. I'll show you how I did that. I thought this was cool. I got, uh, you all remember Marlon, my buddy that works at Facebook. He gave me the command for doing that. It's just a simple IP tables command. I'm basically saying any output going towards 143, limit it to 8,333 packets per second. <laughs> mathematically, uh, a packet is 1,500 bytes. If, if your MTU is 1,500, uh, mathematically, that works out to 100 megabits per second. Uh, give or take. Mm. Okay. Um, so that's running. There was 17%. That's going to take a couple of more minutes. Let me show you. I, I Remember the, the slide that showed the real world example? Let me go back to that. Right there. Okay. This is my diagram of my network out in New York. Um, Replica 3 is our test server that we use. We we, um, we have our entire application uh, on this server and we, rep we replicate the database there. And then what I do is I will take that replica, I'll promote it to be a primary and that's my test database then. 
so that I'm working with, you know, 2.2 terabytes of data. Uh, I can test my application against real current data that way. So once I break the replica and I promote it to be a primary, then I, I rename the directory to have like today's date in it so that I know that that, that database is from November uh, 10th. In fact, I just did this today about three o'clock this afternoon. Um, I created a new database or I, I, I broke the replica, promoted it to be a primary, and then I started a new replica running. 2.2 terabytes takes about four and a half hours to run. I have that running on this screen. Can you see this? Yeah, it's pretty little. Um, let me make it bigger. Uh, what is that doing? There we go. Okay. Um, it's still replicating. <laughs> it's 80% of the way done but it's still going. <laughs> uh, and it should finish um, maybe 930 or so tonight. Um, so then that machine will have the third replica will be good again. And I've got my snapshot of the database from about three o'clock this afternoon. So it's got really current data in it. Now it's not up to the minute current, but it's it's uh, like we we're trying to diagnose a problem that happened yesterday in the billing department. And so I took a new snapshot of the database. So now I have their data in a copy of the database. So it works out really well for us. So you don't see that the replication, especially two of them, causes much degradation in the network? Nope. nope. With a, well, you got a gigabit network there? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a gigabit network. Wow. Um, they have a lot of other stuff going on in that network too. They, um, it's a radiologist. They do mammograms. They do MRIs. They do uh, obviously X-rays, uh, ultrasounds. They've got images flying all over that network. Hmm. Um, they've got a big, huge Cisco switch that keeps everything in order, so that you know we're not seeing all that traffic at every node. And it's uh, it just works great. So yeah, um, wow. uh, it's really not a problem to the network. They don't even notice it when I do this. Uh, yeah, so let's see. How so are... while we're waiting, yeah. general question. You mentioned a, the word cluster early yes. in the talk. And I think yeah. I've missed the significance of that term. OK. Usually, when I think of a cluster, I think of like um, a VMware cluster or a cluster, a Beowulf cluster, a cluster yeah. of machines. Yes. Postgres has taken that term to mean a blob. <laughs> I, I mean, even blob is the wrong word to use because that usually means binary large object. Uh, they've taken it to mean um, basically. Oh, by the way, my. Uh, my uh, thing is finished. My replication is finished. But see this thing? See that thing called database? That directory? Yeah. That's a cluster. That's a Postgres cluster. It can contain multiple databases. If I do this, uh, I'm, I'm going to start the database first. Starts. Uh, no, I don't have start on here because I haven't done it yet. I don't have it in my history on this machine. If I do dash I dash U Postgres dash D first. PG control. Huh? That's supposed to be PG control. Thanks. And in fact, it's supposed to be more than that. It's supposed to be sudo yeah. at that point. Uh, Postgres, then it's PG CTL. Thank you. Start. I'm going to start the database. There, it started. I'm going to connect to the database. OK. Um, uh, let's see. I am connected to a specific database right now. Or I have, I'm sorry, I'm connected to the cluster, but I've opened a specific database. If I do a slash L, it'll list all my databases in this cluster. Yeah. Uh, the only one I've created is Mug. There are other databases that Postgres provides for you, some templates and stuff. OK, so in, in Postgres terms, uh, database cluster is just this this uh, collection of databases. 
you know, that all all stored in a certain directory. Can I take a stab at it? Yeah. Yeah. So a, a Postgres server is um, a collection of clusters. Yes. The clusters are a collection of databases, and the databases are a collection of tables. So it's one extra layer uh, yeah. from the MySQL layer that everyone is is used to, where or a lot of people are used to, where it's you have your database, and then you have um, you have your server, and then you have your databases, and then you have your tables. In Postgres, you have the added layer at the yes. server level of clusters that yes. contain databases. Yes. Does that answer your question? So would different clusters then be in different directories? They would be in different directories, and you'd have a different uh, process running on a different network port accessing that. In fact, I do that a lot, too. OK. Yep. Um, uh, on that test server that I was showing you, I uh, every time I make a snapshot, I don't blow away my old snapshot. I've got like four snapshots on that machine. Well, three of them. I've got th I've got a replica that's currently being built, and I've got three snapshots, and I've got them all running. They're just all listening on different ports. It's different versions of my database at different points in time. Sure. All right. So those are those are. Uh, a, a replica cluster happening right now and three uh, snapshot clusters that are running in three different directories on uh, three different ports. And so when we replicate, are we replicating a cluster? Yes. Yes. It's everything. Okay. Uh, the thing with uh, uh, wall log shipping in Postgres is it's all or nothing. You're either going to get the entire cluster or nothing. So if you've if got five dead, databases, they're all being replicated at once. Yeah, yeah, they're all part of that uh, that cluster. Okay. They're all going to yeah. get copied to the other server. Okay. Um, and and the way you distinguish between clusters is how? Well, you you connect with PSQL. Um, when I do this, like I, I use PSQL, and by default, I'm really going dash h 127.0.0.1 dash p5432. The last argument is the name of the database I want to connect to. Right. Okay. I don't have to supply these because that's the default. Yeah. So I'm just saying PSQL mug that's going to connect me and to the cluster and open up the mug database. Okay. So I do that, and there's my databases. Uh, if I had instead done this, uh, I think I can connect to that database. Yeah. So now I'm connected to the Postgres database. If In I, the default uh, cluster. You just do a slash C <clears throat> change connection, yeah. too. Yes, I can. I, uh, yeah, so uh, slash L will show me the databases. I can do a slash C to connect to. Uh, one of these won't let me connect. I forget which one it is. Oh, I can connect to that one. I think I can. Yeah, I can't connect oh, to yeah. template zero. They won't let me. But I can connect to mug. OK. And if you had a second cluster, how would you how would you tell PSQL that you want to connect to that cluster? I would be running it on a different port. Aha. OK. So not by name, it's by port. Yeah. By port. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Instead of five four three two, I go to five four three three. Whatever port I want my database to be running on. Okay. All right. And the way I can figure that, since uh, we're doing okay for time, I think. Uh, slash serve slash database. If I go into the PostgreSQL.conf table and search for port, it's right there. Oh, I hate this incremental search thing in Vim. It's right there. See, the default is yep. 5432. Uh, if yep. I uncomment that out and change that, then, then when I start up the database, it's going to listen on 5433. OK. So okay. Um, So I've got two databases running now, right? I've got uh, Replica 1 running. I've got Replica 2 that I started up. That's over here. Um, uh, let's see find the right window here. That's where is uh, primary. Go to primary. I'm going to bring up uh, bug. 
select star from PG replication slots. See that? I got two replicas now. They're both active. All right? And they're both at the same point. This restart LSN thing, that kind of tells you what what wall file is currently being sent over, being uh, uh, consumed by the by the um, um, by the replica. Watch, watch what happens. Uh, let me shrink this just a bit so that it all fits on one line. There we go. Can you guys see that? Okay. Yeah. The font's not too small. Okay. Let me find. Uh, oh, I'm going to open What's up there? another. I'm going to open up another window um, into the primary, uh, SSH primary. Let me get into the mug directory, PSQL mug. Uh, watch what happens when I create more rows. Um, create, let's do 100K rows. Okay, I'm going to run this command. Oh, I should do this. Uh, now, if we watch this, okay, it took that long for uh, for replica two to become consistent. I'll do it again. Watch this. All right, every two seconds we're reselecting um, uh, PG replication slots. I'm going to go ahead and create another 100,000 rows. You see that? Mm -hmm. Replica one became oh. consistent almost immediately. Yeah. Replica two is still trying to catch up. Okay. Remember on that slide, I talked about uh, uh, asynchronous um, uh, replication. They're consistent eventually. Yeah. That's yeah. That's what's going on here. They are consistent eventually. That's your slower connection, though, right? Yeah, replica replica one is a gigabit connection. Replica okay. two is a hundred megabit connection. That's why it's falling behind, right? Sure. And and that happens in real life for me all the time, right? I've got this one machine thirty miles away over a two hundred megabit uh, WAN. Uh, so when we do big operations on the database, that one can lag behind. But, you know, eventually it's consistent. And, you know, if you think about it, back in the olden days, I know, I know uh, Jim uh, is familiar with this. We used to uh, have servers running and we'd back them up every night. Yep. Right? So, and I don't want to say replication is a replacement for backup. Done right. It's a great replacement. You got to sure. make sure you do it right. But, you know, uh, uh, the our, our customers, they could they could come in in the morning and they could work all day. At 5 o'clock, um, uh, when they normally would go to put the tape drive in, their system could crap out. Let's say their hard disk fails. In fact, I, I know of at least one case where somebody had the tape in their hand, they went to put it in the tape drive, and they had static electricity built up. When they touched... The tape to the, to the <laughs> tape drive. There was a static jump, yeah. or a spark, took the machine down. Uh, did I don't know if it's what it was, but anyway, their backup was no good. They didn't have a backup, at least not on that tape. Uh, their their disk had to be replaced. Uh, they were they lost a whole day's worth of work, assuming their backup from the previous night was still good. Sure, right? That's no fun. Here, yeah. here, we're talking about maybe losing the last transaction. Yeah, a few seconds, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know, for that for that remote office, you could lose a little more than the last transaction because it's a slower link. But you know, what kind of catastrophic problems could you have where that's a real problem? As long as you have an on-site replica, you're in pretty good shape, right? I mean, the, the, the thing to think about as well, an earthquake comes through and swallows up your, uh, <laughs> your or, or a tornado comes by and wipes out your data center, right? In which case, you've got a 
almost up to date database at the, in, you know in the in the data center 30 miles away losing a couple of transactions is not the highest thing on your mind at this point <laughs> no right you're still trying to find your car <laughs> uh so in your example here of remote office, is that yeah. actually a second office functioning office? Yes. Yeah. In this case, it's not a it's not just a data center. It's actually a one of their offices. They, this practice has seven offices. Uh, All right. One so of them this the office, then they're connected normally to the primary in your example, not the yeah, normally the users in that office are just coming across that that two hundred megabit pipe. Uh, sure running their application off the primary server. Our okay. application is all web-based, so they're just pointing their web browsers at the primary. Sure. Right, at the application server in the primary, uh, in the main office. If, uh, if if a tornado came and took away their building, they would just have to reconfigure and point their browsers at the, at the- uh, Remote? At the disaster recovery site, the remote office, yeah. Yeah. And all the other offices could point at the, at that same office, right? It's just the, the main office got wiped off the face of the earth by a tornado. Sure. So, Jim. Oh, yes. Jim, you, you, you've tested this. Yes. Uh, and, and made it work. Has it ever happened in real live production? You I, actually needed to use it? I, I, I may regret saying this. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't, don't, don't answer. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. No, no, no. I won't. Definitely... Right? Yeah. Right? Let me just say the testing works great. Yeah, I would say in theory. Yeah, question yeah. And answer. Thanks. Yeah, in fact, we're we're supposed to test every three months. We don't do it that often. I I, I do it when they beg me to do it because it's just a pain in the ass. Sure. You know, it's just it's just it's not hard to do. It just chews up time to go through it, and that's a lot of coordination. Yeah. yeah and, uh, let me solve real problems for you. I mean, yeah. it's great to don't get me wrong. You should test. Because if you don't test, you don't know if it's going to work when you need it. Yep. You just don't make testing that often. If you, haven't, if you haven't tested, it won't work. Yeah, right. You, if, if you haven't tested, you it, don't have it. it. It does. It does not work because something that's, will be wrong. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay. So um, let's get back to the slides. There's only a couple of more to go. So one other thing is, is when yeah. you were showing the replication speed on the 100 megabit simulated yeah. link, yeah. we saw the number of something that's hiding behind your slide there increment slowly. Yes. The restart LSN. Yes. Is, is that an indication that as you're creating these records, each of them is a transaction? And what we were seeing earlier that I was talking about, where we saw it jump, it was just because it's so fast. This is finer grained than a transaction. Okay. Okay. These are actually pages, and a page is—I I don't know what a page is on Postgres 4K, maybe. Okay. Um, uh, these are these are pages that we're sending over. So when you see these numbers move, it's it's moving in that many pages at a time. Um, so if we'd watch the same uh, counting account of number of rows, we'd have seen the 100 uh, meg replica two jump. Also, it would just taken longer for it to do so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, there's a way to to look at this number and look at. Um, where do I want? That's the primary. Okay. Um, I'm gonna so service to base. Um, if I go into see this here, PG wall. That's where the those right ahead log files are. Those things there. There's actually a way to map in these files. Um, I mean, these files contain lots of pages. 16 meg, it looks like, right? 16 meg each. Yeah, yeah, these are 16 megs. So there's a lot of pages in each file. And these, these files are not, uh, not something you can do much with if you look at it, right? It's just a bunch of stuff. 
it's, it's not like text. It's certainly not like select, uh, certainly not like insert uh, yeah. into table, right? It's, um, wow. it's a lot more than that. Anyway, um, so I was saying, there's a way to get a rough idea of this. In fact, you see that CF there? Yeah. Uh, where did it go? Uh, too many windows open. That's this here. Uh, in that case, it's not a CF. It's uh, anyway. There's a. Uh, you see the BA. Yeah. That's that right there. Um. That's the latest though. BA is the latest. Yeah, it is, and I forget why these things. Um, why you see higher numbers? Um. I think it's actually. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. No, I think um, remember that other table from PG Stat repli uh, replication um, here. Well, you still can't see it. Anyway, I've I've done some looking. Like when I've when I when my server in that remote office has gotten very very out of date or very very behind, I've watched. I've sat and watched it try to catch up. And you can kind of map it to these files. Hmm. Uh, somebody, I'm sure, much smarter than me would know how it actually hmm. works. So, are uh, those files created in a sort of a or, or written to in a round robin fashion? Um, if if we do an LS minus well, LT, would it would it show what order they were written? Well, if you look at the timestamp on it, yes, yeah, they are. I think what it is is these files, I think, get pre-allocated. Uh huh. Right, because I think uh, you know, like forty minutes ago, almost these files were. I I I think they're. Um, Your slide had the know. same date and time on all of the files. Um. So I assume that you took that screenshot shortly after. Uh, it was shortly creating. after I did a big insert. Uh, yeah. The first insert. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they are. It are. It is kind of a round robin, but I think as it reuses the file, it actually renames the file, and I think it's pre-allocating those files so that they're there, ready to go, mm -hmm. so that uh, creating the next block of pages or the next set of pages happens very, very quickly. Right. Right. That is the current file right there. Okay. And there's even tools within Postgres for you to dump these things and see what's in them. Okay. So. Let's uh, let's get up to about. Uh, I think I was all the way up to page. Let's see, I did that. Promoted yeah. the replica. It's the last one. Yeah. Okay. So some goodies. Uh, I showed you how to create a replication slot. This is how you drop them. Oh, oh, hang on. This is how you drop a replication slot. And it's important to know how to do that. And here's why. Let's go back to this guy. All right. Here's my two replica slots. Replication slots. Right. Once I use a replication slot, it remembers that you've used it, and it remembers what the last um, uh, transaction or page, I guess, it remembers what the last page is that you've received. Um, if your replica goes down, the the uh, pages are stored in that in that directory. Uh, and move things around. The pages are stored in this directory. Now, right now, uh, on, the primary. Was, on the primary, they're saved there. Uh, DMS SH dot. Okay. There's, I'm chewing up 353 megs right now in these files. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if my replica goes down, I will start building, creating more and more and more of those files because I because the database knows it hasn't been able to send them to the replica yet. So it better hang on to them. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, we want to hang on to them until we finally send them there. And once we send them, there's parameters in the Postgres config file to say how many replica files or how many uh, how many of these wall files you want to hang on to or how many megabytes you want to hang on to, or how long you want to keep them. And you want to keep that tuned kind of small because it's just chewing up space. But if a replica goes online, it's going to start growing. 
and it'll keep on growing until that replica comes back or you delete the replica slot. Like, let's say you had a replica and now you've taken it offline and you're not going to put it back. Just go re remove that replica slot or the replication slot. And then the database will know it doesn't need to hang on to those pages anymore and it can throw them away. Hmm. Okay. Um, another thing. It's weird that that's done with a select. That's how you execute functions in Postgres. And in fact, that's probably how you do it in MySQL too, right? Hmm. Okay. Um, anyway, um, you do this and it returns true or false, if it succeeded or not. Um, delay replication. Here you can have fun. You can, in the Postgres config file, you can set your recovery min apply delay. And here I've got to set to 10 seconds. That's, that's 10,000 milliseconds, right? Got set to 10 seconds. Oh, I'll go back. Um, you can you can play games like you could set it to two hours if you wanted. And basically, your replica will always be two hours behind. And that's handy if you if you um, executed a command on the primary that has disastrous effects, like drop table. Hmm. You didn't really you didn't really mean to do that. Um. Your replica, your time delayed replica, still going to have that table for another two hours. Um, so it gives you a chance to step in and, and uh, you know maybe break your replica and hang onto that file. In in real life use, I, I don't see much use for it. It's just kind of neat that you can do that if you want. <laughs> right. The other thing is we've been doing this select on this uh, PG replication slots. You're not going to sit there and do that all day long to make sure that everything's happy, right? So I suggest you set up something like Nagios to monitor it for you. And here's the command, the line you'd put in your NRPE, that config file. I don't know. Anybody out there using Nagios? I, I, I swear by it. Rather than me uh, having to monitor my own systems, I let the system monitor itself or the be monitored by my Nagio server, and I just get alerts when there's something not right. So anyway, I've created this command to um, occasionally check. I'm not even sure how occasional this happens, whatever Nagios does. I think it's every couple of minutes. It will check my replication status. And here I've got it. I'm only checking replica one, but I could duplicate that line and say I want to check replica two as well. This command, this check PG replication, is just a bash shell script. Uh, and, and this is it. And I just threw it in here just to show you what you can do. The bulk of it is making sure you pass the correct options and stuff. The real work is happening right here. Select active from PG replication slots where slot name equals dollar slot. I don't know if you guys can see that, but uh, I'll include these slides you know, so, so that you guys can uh, actually look at it yourself if you want. I think it's very important that you monitor your replication. Make sure it's working because, again, if it fails and you don't know it failed, you don't have a replica. All right. And finally, in summary, uh, it's a very, fairly simple set of things you need to do to set up replication. You've got to grant permission in your PGHBA file. That's where I created those two lines that said replica or replication. You need to create your replica slots. You need to use PG-based backup to actually initialize your replica. And then you need to monitor your replication slots for inactive replicas. So questions? How's that for time? We'd be, we'd be getting the announcement at the library that the internet's going to shut off. <laughs> okay. So when you set this up, you said you, you usually do not have the database start automatically at boot yes. time. Yes. Does that imply that if you have a server failure and it reboots itself, that you will have to manually log in? Yeah. And yeah. So welcome yeah, to does. the 2 a.m. beeper call or something. It's just, you know what? Linux is so reliable. Yeah. And my servers, I set up servers with, for specific tasks. If my database server runs the database, that's it. My my web server runs Apache. That's it. 
I, I don't I don't have problems where servers spontaneously reboot. They just run and run yeah. and run. I, I get up times of like 1200, 1300 days. <laughs> you know, that's three years, three, three plus years, you know, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finally have to reboot it because we're moving equipment around or we're finally going <laughs> to upgrade, upgrade to the newest uh, version of Ubuntu or whatever. But I don't reboot these machines at all. Yeah. Um, and they, they, and they don't reboot themselves. So I don't have, uh, if, if the, you know, if the hardware were flaky or the operating system was flaky and I was rebooting all the time, I'd be looking for, well, first of all, I'd probably have it restart the database by itself, but because my file systems are encrypted, I really can't do that. Right. I, I, I have to enter manually the passphrase to unlock the file systems. So, Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. 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 More just questions? Took, just took up an Arduino board that anytime it detects a, uh, a reboot, it just hooks into the USB and types in your passphrase for you. Don't yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I have a, a question. Um, yeah. uh, you've done a lot of talking about the uh, recoverability, whatever, durability. Do you ever, have you used this for performance purposes and how has that worked out? I, I don't. Um, um, I, I occasionally consider setting up uh, so that readers can read the replicas. Um, but we just, uh, I've got 140 users on this machine. It really, performance really hasn't been a problem where I needed to boost it. Like I, I take a little bit of a hit for using encrypted file systems. But to me, I, you know, it's something I have to do because it's medical data. And um, the performance is still really, really good. Now, how do you, if you direct readers to just to one of the replicas for reading, do, how do you do that? Do you, do you just know that certain transactions, is it coded in? Well, the then you got you to gotta make sure your application knows to do that, right? You got to, you got to uh, possibly make two connections to your database, one to your, one to your replica and one to your primary and direct all your reads to to one database and all your updates to the other database. So that, that's, other that's coded into your app then it knows whether. Yeah, you can do that. You can also, I, I, I'm pretty sure PG pool will it works at a, at a layer where it can intercept your SQL command and figure out where to send them. Okay. Uh, but that gets tricky if you're inside a transaction. Yeah. Because yeah, sometimes you're in a transaction, you're going to do an update, then you might have to read something and do an insert somewhere else. You want all of those things to go to the, to go to the right, uh, yeah. to the same database server. Okay. Yeah. I think for me, this is really about, like you said, durability, um, making sure that my data is safe. Uh, I, my purpose for using it is not for performance. Um, do you keep, do you keep your logs, you know, for months at a time in case you have some major disaster and have to rebuild forward? Um, I, in fact, I do, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the wall, the PG wall directory. Yeah. You, you can configure in your Postgres config file, an archive command. And what that'll do is th this is how you used to have to do replication. What the archive command will do is, is, uh, it'll assume that like the first argument is, is the, uh, wall file and then you can do whatever you want with that file and what i was doing or what i fact, what i still am doing is i'm taking that file i'm compressing it with bzip too and i'm storing it on a on another machine i send it across uh, in this case it's nfs i, I shoot it across nfs see am i doing nfs now i guess i'm doing scp now i'll SCT, scp it to another machine and store it over there uh, and, then, and then what we do um, remember I said this isn't a replacement for backup? Yes. Weekly, we do a backup. We'll do a PG. Um, in fact, I, I do a PG-based backup to another another directory. I'll take that, and I'll, I'll compress it with bzip2, and I'll send that to a backup server that we have. And uh, meanwhile, the archive command is sending all of those wall files to that server. Okay. So like, you know, you know, if, if we had a real catastrophic event and I had to 
uh, take like Saturday's backup. In fact, my backup takes uh, my backup starts Saturday morning and it finishes Sunday night. <laughs> um, I, if I took that Sunday backup and all the wall files, I could I could start up the database and I could, uh, along with the archive command, as a recovery command, um, uh, it's a configuration item, and I would point at that at that directory of of wall files, and it would just start applying them yes. one after the other, and it just um, I don't know how long it would take to get my database back up and running if I had to do that. You know, it has a, a lot to do with how, you know. If it failed on Monday morning, that would be one thing. It probably wouldn't take that long to apply all the wall files. If it happened on Friday night, mm. it would take uh, quite a bit of time, I think, to do that. Still, uh, so I've had to do that in the past. Have you? Yeah, yeah. You know, with, you don't want to know yeah. what kind of user error, but it's still much less time than any other way of trying to rebuild. <laughs> yeah, that's why I like to use my replicas. Uh, yeah, I have those for my safety. But again, you know, having those wall files, uh, and then I think we we keep those things around for like three weeks. We, we don't keep them forever. Okay. Um, but we do have it, you know, just in case there's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I certainly can't go to my customer and say, "Geez, I'm sorry, we lost all your data." <laughs> <laughs> this, this company's been in business. I, I I I've they've been a customer of mine since 1986. Oh, great. Uh, we have data going back to about 92 oh. right now. I can't tell them that we don't have that data anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it just wouldn't work. That's why it's 2.2 terabytes of data. Uh, we, we don't we don't hang on to everything, but we we do hang on to a lot. Okay, oh. Thanks. Sure. So questions, anybody else? No. Uh, if anybody has questions later on, send me an email. There's my I mean, email I, information. I kind of have one question. 